Sono Federico Cella, eh, giornalista del Corriere della Sera e ho il piacere di darvi il benvenuto alla terza edizione di Games Week, la fiera italiana dei videogiochi che chi ha avuto modo di vedere anche gli anni scorsi sta diventando sempre più grande e sempre più interessante. La vostra fortuna oggi, una delle vostre fortune è che non siete qui per sentire parlare me, mentre la mia fortuna è di presentarvi la persona che siete venuti ad ascoltare, ossia Nolan Bushnell. Lui è conosciuto universalmente come il papà dei videogiochi, nel 72 ha fondato Atari e ha dato il via alla storia che stiamo vivendo ancora adesso con il videogioco Pong che è stato il primo a essere commercializzato. Quindi se oggi siamo qui e tutti voi e tutti noi stiamo facendo questo lavoro è grazie a lui e gli passo la parola. Nolan, grazie mille. Ah. <laughs> well, we'll get some slides up here and have some fun. The, um, first of all, I love Italy. <laughs> you know, you guys have one of the best lifestyles in the world. And uh, it's, it's ironic that maybe one of the best uh, brands in the world are two guys who are Italian, but they've, brought, they've been brought to you by a Japanese company, you know, Luigi and Mario. <laughs> but what it really means is that I think that Italy, as you develop a culture of game design have so many opportunities to create IP here that it can be worldwide. And so the best game that is yet to be developed may be developed right here in Italy. And that's one of the things we want to do. So let's talk about the power of creativity. Creativity drives the future. And what you want to do is constantly think of that as what you want to do is create the future. The best way to predict the future is to create it. I basically have just done a, a uh, book called Finding the Next Steve Jobs. And it is really about the pathway to creativity because creativity took Apple, who was almost ready to go bankrupt, and turned it into the most, the largest market cap company in the world. Bigger than oil, bigger than gas, bigger than insurance, bigger than banking. The, the saga my life of this sort of happened at an amusement park. I started my career as a ham radio operator. If you were a geek in the 60s and the 50s, it was ham radio because the computer really hadn't, you know, it was just a big nightmare. Summers, while I was in college, I worked at an amusement park. And I ended up having not just a bunch of kids working for me, but an arcade. And I soon learned the economics of the coin-operated game business. But I didn't invent the video game. The very first video game was done by a fellow named Willie Higginbotham. And he did a ping pong game on an oscilloscope. This is the only picture of that game that exists in the world today. It was a humble beginning. Then, 
Nobody knows who these people are. These were my professors at the University of Utah. What you see there is a frame buffer. Each one of those cards was one flip-flop. So if you look at that, each one of those cards was essentially a bit of video information. You, you, if you were to multiply, if you were to multiply that by about a thousand, you'd have the video capability that is in your iPhone. So we've come a long way. This, if you could imagine, I was 20 years old, and I went at two o'clock in the morning into this computer room. And there I saw a game written by a guy named Steve Russell called Space War. Oops. And that screen in the middle was when I first played a video game. And of course, that's a million dollar computer. And I thought to myself, if I could bring that screen into my arcade, people would play it, and they'd put a lot of money in it. But at 25 cents a time, it wouldn't really pay for a million dollar computer. So I said, I knew that, I knew that, vid that uh, computer power was dropping every day in cost. And I said, someday, I will be able to turn that into a game. And I did. The, uh, this is the Pong game. My partner on the left, the head of finance was there, and then Al Alcorn, who actually did the circuitry for Pong, is on the right, the, the guy in the beard. Of course, I grew a beard later, but he was, he was the first. This was actually the first game. This game was Space Wars, and I modeled the cabinet in modeling clay, took it to a, a speedboat manufacturer who made things out of fiberglass. He scaled it up and made the cabinet. Everybody was flabbergasted at this game. It didn't look like a video or a coin-operated game. It didn't act like a coin-operated video or a game of any sort. And it was perhaps too revolutionary because all my friends loved it, but all my friends were engineers. When we put this onto, into a bar, if the bar was close to a college, it did really well. If it was a working man's bar, it earned no money at all. So it was successful, but not successful. But Pong really took off because you could play the game, beer in one hand, turn the knob with the other. And the other thing that was really fun is that it was just the beginning of women's liberation. And women could beat, the, the average woman could beat the average man at Pong. And, and that was really puzzling to everybody because women weren't considered to be able to play sports. But they have better small muscle coordination than men do. You know, men can throw a ball, women, you know, always throw a ball like a girl. <laughs> but, but in Pong, they could be. We had Pong hustlers. I remember one little blonde that was about five foot one. She made $50,000 a year Pong hustling. It was really funny to watch. Then I did a thing called Chuck E. Cheese, which was a pizza restaurant with a great big arcade attached. And then this is my lab, and I created a uh, robot. 
and lost about $28 million. So this was failure. Uh, <laughs> but I loved it, and it was a great, it was a fun project. I then did a, a company called ETAC, which was the very first automobile navigation company. And we sold that to Rupert Murdoch, and if you do Google Maps or anything, it's all based on our database. We were the first people to map the world digitally. I believe that everybody should read science fiction. That the more science fiction you read, the more you're ready to see what the future will bring. Because most of the things that happens in science fiction will happen shortly, with the possible exception of time travel. But maybe not. The most important thing you can have is enthusiasm and creativity. And then you need optimism. You need to believe in your heart that you can succeed. And the minute you believe that you can succeed, you have a good chance of actually succeeding in your project. I can guarantee you one thing. If you never try, you will fail. If you do try, sometimes you'll fail. But most of the time, you'll be able to learn and move forward. So everybody in this room has the opportunity to become the next Steve Jobs, or the next Nolan Bushnell if you want to. I've had a good life. Uh, and it's, it's still great fun. But the key is, get up every morning, look at yourself in the mirror, and say, you are really cool, and you're going to be successful. And start to really believe it. And if you do it every day, pretty soon, it'll happen. When you are looking for partners in your business, always hire for creativity and in passion and intensity. Those are much more important than the individual skills. Passion trumps everything. Steve was actually a pretty crappy engineer. But Steve Wozniak was an excellent one. But what Jobs had was a passion to do things. And if you look at it, I'd say two-thirds of the things that Steve tried failed. The Lisa, the, the Apple III, these were all really crappy products. And yet, he, we learned a lot. Now, Steve, when he worked for me, was really difficult. But he had passion. He also didn't smell very good. And uh, walking through a bunch of you guys, you've got that down pad. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you can be obnoxious, you can smell not that great, and you can still succeed. So take heart. Let's see, skunk it up. Let me do a few of these things. I think I got the, you know, this is the different, this is a different slide. Oh, well. The, um, innovation, innovation is a different thing. I need, uh, let's see. No, I, I guess that's okay. I'll, let me just go. Okay. Through. Yeah. Don't vote on an innovation. Innovation is really almost an insular thing. If you, like, how many people here believe in innovation? Raise your hands. Everybody. Everybody believes in innovation. But. 
When I say, how many people believe in left-handed monkey wrenches with, uh, that are pink? I don't know if that's an innovation or not, but the particular innovation that you look at never sounds right. And so stick to your guns. If you have a good idea for a video game and you present it to 100 people and they all say, boy, that sucks, don't believe them. You have to believe in your passion and go for it. A lot of people don't realize this, but Steve Jobs thought that or his board of directors fought him in doing the iPad or the iPod every bit. They said, we're a computer company. What are we getting into the music business for? But Steve persevered, and that really led to what was going on. Nobody at Apple wanted to get into the music business. They thought it was silly. But Steve, being the irascible person he was, persisted. So remember that new ideas are almost never accepted. Let's talk about those a little bit. This is a quote that I like a lot. Another one, enthusiasm. Who knows what this is? This is, this is Google Glass. How many believe that this is going to be, the Google Glass is going to be a really important step in the next few years? I do. I think that it's going to be a gaming platform. Not only that, this is the Google Glass, but do you know that Microsoft is working on the same thing right now? Do you know that Netflix is working on, on Google Glass? Some people believe that this is just a step away from having implants. Some people predict that the smartphone will totally go away in 15 years, 10 years. That it'll all be implants and wearable computers. But there's actually a couple of different ways. The Google Glass, if you haven't worn them, basically says that there's always a screen available right here. So when you're looking at the regular things, that's fine. But you actually have a view here. This is a different one. This is a heads-up display where your augmented reality is actually put on top of the screen going forward. So for example, this is what the world could look like when you have augmented reality. Um, this is a little bit funny, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Or this, so that you can just walk down the street and see the th things. You can see ads, you can see positions. This is going to be the future that you are living in. And I, I really recommend that you look at some of these things, this or this, as being a area that needs a lot of innovation. It may be that a game in this environment, now let's just imagine for a minute, let's suppose that you don't realize it but there's another world right here on top of where we are. Maybe even sitting next to you or under your seat, there are evil monkeys. The only way you can see the evil monkeys is through these headsets. We all know that we have to get rid of the evil monkeys as fast as we can. And if you question whether or not there are, in fact, evil monkeys here, just take your headphones, put them in your pocket, and then pull them out again. The evil monkeys have tangled them all up. That's the only answer to how 
things can get so tangled in your pocket when you didn't realize it. It's the work of the evil monkeys. Anyway, um, don't forget that there's a world out here. And this is a laser maze that one of my sons made that think of it as an arcade that mashes up games and movies in an environment. It takes about a half hour to go through all the games. The laser maze is just one of them. And, it turn, and they are currently building them in the United States with really good success. That system right there does about a million dollars a year in a, uh, in a shopping mall. You guys have the skills, you can build these here. And uh, if you want to get a license so you don't have to do that, it's available. This is the other one that I think is really important. This is called Oculus Rift, and it is a virtual reality system. I believe that it's highly probable that this will be the video game system of the future. I believe that virtual reality, we tried it 15, 20 years ago, but because of latency and display technology problems, it would make people sick. And generally, if you want to have a successful product, you don't want to make your customers sick. And it was motion sickness. And the thing about the Oculus is it has such a huge field of view. Some people believe you also need an artificial horizon, which they're putting in, and you need low latency. That is, from the time you move your head until the, the world looks better, or the same, needs to be less than a, probably five to 10 milliseconds. The software is fast enough now that we're getting those kinds of speeds. I believe that that will eliminate the motion sickness with all but a handful of the population. This is the holodeck. For those of you who are Star Trek fans, the reality that you can get in this kind of a headset is truly remarkable. This is a uh, hovercraft video driving game that was developed around, and it is such a, an immersive experience. You feel like you are totally in a race car. Of course, the other thing that you need to think about is games that can be made in a maker bot. This is, you may think that this is not a video game, but it uses a lot of the video game skills, the 3D rendering, creation of things, and board games are still important. And so to create games that you can print out to play, I believe is, a, is something worthy of the video game community to work on. What's this? This is nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is going to be part of the gaming environment. That little fly up uh, above has a full high resolution camera. And so you can have those fly around under your computer control and do some interesting things. This other one is a, a microbot that actually is inside your bloodstream. You may not think it to be a video game because this is being used to you know, clean out arteries and do some things like that. But there's no reason why we couldn't play a video game in which we're, fl we're flying around objects in our own body. Now that'd be kind of a fun game, wouldn't it? New World. What's this? This is actually a motor. And this is a motor of, that is based in nanotech. That motor is smaller than the head of a pin. And it can pump gases and items 
and it's going to be a very important part of your future. Total Recall. This is a Johnny Cab, and uh, it's and it could drive you around. Well, turns out that Google and BMW and Honda and Fujitsu and Ford all have auto drive cars that are planned to be rolling out within the next three to five years. There will be a hundred auto drive taxis in Las Vegas next year. Now, what does that mean? Auto drive cars will probably be the biggest revolution that will happen in your lifetime. Because all of a sudden, the world fundamentally changes. For example, auto drive cars allow the traffic jam to go away. A, auto drive, a fleet of auto drive cars increases the capacity of every lane of traffic in the world by 20. Because you can drive nose to tail at 200 kilometers an hour safely. More than that, once you, do, you drive nose to tail, your gas mileage goes up because only one car of the whole convoy has to get rid of wind resistance. And so a car that normally basically gets 30 miles a gallon will get 50 miles a gallon, 80 miles a gallon. And if they're electric, you get even more benefit. What that also means is that every mass transit system in the world becomes obsolete. You say, what? Well, why? Well, if you don't have congestion and you have auto drive cars, the cost per mile of an auto drive cars is less than 50 euros. So we all know that every mass transit system in the world costs about two, to two euros. And it only costs that much with a, with a lot of government subsidy. So the cost of providing that mile, most, most uh, mass transit trips are a mile, maybe two. So it becomes cheaper to take a Johnny cab than mass transit. Now think about that. You, it'll take a little while for your brains to wrap around that one. Because you say, well, but there's thousands of people that are on, on these units. How can you possibly be able to, to promise no traffic jams? If you go through the math, you'll find that there's no traffic jams if zero riders are on mass transit. When you say that to political people, they go nuts. They don't want to believe it, and yet it's real. So uh, it will be so funny to watch it happen. And of course, here in Italy, all I can think about is during the transition, you've never seen strikes like you'll see then. <laughs> anyway. What's this? This is a picture from Avatar. It's basically glowing plants. Did you ever want to visit that jungle? It's really cool. Right now, you can buy this for your home. These are, glowing, these are automatically glowing mushrooms. There are genetically engineered plants, and the parks in five to 10 years will be lit up at night, just like the jungles in Avatar. 
It's happening right in front of us right now. I kind of think that's going to be cool. I don't think you can eat those, though, but, <laughs> but maybe. A young man, Johnny, went to his first day of class, and the teacher said, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And of course, Johnny said, well, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, but what we're, what we're really talking about now is this whole idea of what's the school of the future going to be? And it turns out that we're in the middle of the perfect storm. 10 years ago, the networks were not good enough to really be effective in school. The hardware was too expensive. Today, hardware, there's a $35 tablet that's available out of India right now. As you know, you can pick up an Android tablet for $100, $200 very cheaply. This is going to fundamentally change school. What's really the important driver, though, is brain science. I have a company right now in which we're developing software based on the latest brain science that is teaching 10 times faster than the classroom. So kids that are working on their tablets, like how would you like to learn a computer language? How would you feel about being able to learn it, all the, all the commands, all the systems, all the syntax, and learn it in two weeks? Unity, as you know, can't, is starting to be taught to 10-year-olds in schools. The, the tools and the ability to learn is going to accelerate in the next 10 years to where you will be able to learn anything in less than a week. It's going to be a wild ride. Software gives you, education software also allows this innovation cycle to start up. If you can test outcomes, modify, get better, like our software is doing 10 times faster. I believe that once we go through this innovation cycle a little while, we'll get up to 20, 25 times. So what does that mean? That means that what you used to learn in four years of school, you can learn in three months. What do you do with all that extra time? Projects. Projects are the things that give you the creativity and the understanding of so many other things that it will be really powerful for you. Students today are very different. For example, they meet for coffee, and they meet for dinner, <laughs> and they meet at a museum, and they go to the beach, and they go to ball games. What's that saying? It's really saying that the real life doesn't provide information fast enough to keep us from being bored. And so we're constantly multitasking. Multitasking our life so that we can get better and better and better. This is, this is my quote. I've been quoted all over the world for it. And it's so true. Everybody who has ever had a shower has had a good idea. The difference is what do you do when you get out? And so, have you ever heard somebody say, oh, he stole my idea? How embarrassing for you. It means that you had an idea and you didn't do anything with it because you were too lazy and too stupid. Think about it. 
If somebody stole your idea, shame on you. Act on things. Don't just have an idea. You don't actually own your ideas until you work on them. You get an idea, you write it down, you do a little research, you start to put things together. It's also important to right size your idea. For example, if you have the idea for a new car, the chances of you raising $3 billion to build that is probably not probable. So try to make your ideas something that is at least accessible. Schools today are designing out creativity. I believe that once we change what we're doing and teach schools in a different way, that we can actually bring creativity back. This doesn't work. Projects, projects, projects are the ways you make creativity. This is a maker fair. And what happened is there's, there was a magazine that started to talk about how to make things, how to build things. And then pretty soon the people wanted to get together. This started out in San Mateo four years ago. And right now, there are over 100,000 people show up to a maker fair. And they have them in Texas and in Florida and in Detroit and in Texas or in uh, New York. And it's a project, the and projects are becoming very, very important. And if you don't have a maker fair here in Italy, figure out a way to start one. Because projects are the ways you bring creativity and you'll invent the future. Every time I go to one of these, I see companies being formed by 12 year olds. Now think about it. 12 year old companies with products. Venture capitalists are going to makers fairs and can totally finding projects and people that they want to invest in. And, and one venture capitalist said, I don't know if I feel good about investing in a company that's run by a bunch of 14 year olds, but they want to. There's a steam carnival, and this is a, this is a carnival, but it uses fire and lasers and things, and it teaches math by turning the games inside out and showing how they're constructed. This happens to be done by my son, so I'm a little partial. Um, but they will be setting up these carnivals for school districts all over the nation. I want to tell you a story. A series of psychology professors decided to do a test. And they wanted to test creativity. And so they went to a pottery class where they were, you know, spinning tables and doing clay and that sort of thing. And they told the left hand side of the class, all you have to do in this semester is to make one pot and it's got to be the best one you've ever seen. To the other side of the class they said you're going to be given a grade based on the weight of the pots you make. If you make the most pots you'll get the A. After the end of the semester where did all the good pots come from? It came from the quantity side. And what it taught them was that experimentation, massive experimentation, doing a lot of things, not having the risk of having to do one good pot, but doing many. And all of a sudden, the creativity flowed. Do a lot of things. If you want to have, Linus Pauling said, if you want to do, have a good idea, 
get lots of ideas. And some of them will be good, and some of them won't. But you won't necessarily know which is which. If you're unemployed right now, that is the best time to start your company. And it doesn't have to be a huge company. You just need to start working on it. Because most of the jobs that will be created will be new. And you might as well figure out how to do it right now. Italy, as several countries around, including the United States, I mean, we have a 7% unemployment rate. I think Italy is somewhat higher than that now. You will not be able to get a job through the normal, the normal pathways. So get used to the idea of starting your own job, building your own job. I'm almost out, okay. Let me, uh, entrepreneurship, sole proprietorship, these are, the, these are the pathways to jobs in the future. Remember that, uh, you guys probably don't get this one. Uh, <laughs> Just because you read it on the internet, don't necessarily believe it. And make sure that you push forward, make things happen, rock and roll. College is not necessarily the pathway. And you can learn so much faster on the internet right now than you can in school. But what it takes is personal discipline. So pat, create your own pathway, get out, make it happen, and have a good life. Keep fun alive. Thank you. Sì, adesso avremo una sessione di domande e risposte all'incirca di 10 minuti, quindi chi vuole fare la domanda alzi la mano che io vengo poi dopo con il gelato. Tell me how crazy I am. Any questions? No questions? Yes. Uh, what do you think about the uh, Omni device uh, which you can uh, move uh, uh, whole of your body and uh, wear uh, the Oculus Rift? I'm not quite understanding, say again. Uh, there is a, an, a device called Omni in uh, which you, you are standing on, uh, on the board and uh, you, you walk, and this device is capable of uh, capturing your, uh, your walk and um, put it in the video game. Well, I think that, that there's all kinds of wonderful new interfaces that are going on, and I think that, that uh, you know, all the way from, you know, the Wii to the Kinect and to some of these other items, they're totally powerful. And What we really want to be able to do is hook our bodies up, you know, like in the Matrix, where you have this great big jack in the back of your head. We're, we're quite a ways from that, and I don't like the idea of it anyway. But uh, I, I think that all these, these systems really augment what we can do. Did you know that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak worked for Atari? Hello. Did you, uh, did, did you also know that I was offered one-third of Apple Computer 
for $50,000? And I said, no. <laughs> Did you know that I, re that I re regret that decision? <laughs> Hello. Oh man, oh man, I've got a lot of those too. You know, you know what? I really. Is there is there a question back there? I also. I really regret selling Atari to Warner. Um, you can't imagine how a bunch of New York suits could screw up a company as fast as they did. Um, we had a project for playing games over the telephone lines with the Atari 2600, where you'd plug a modem in and you could play tank and some of those things over telephone lines. And we were going to have modems in a closet somewhere, and then we were going to link those with high-speed network connections to others. Turns out that the protocol that we had was very similar to the internet. I think that the Atari game net may have turned into the internet 10 years before the internet came alive. Now, wouldn't it have been cool to own Atari and to own the internet? <laughs> yeah. Yes, kind of. My brain is restless. And kind of once I did a video game company, I kind of wanted to do different things. And I've always loved video games, and I've always loved doing them. But, you know, I had such a good time working on a robots, robotics company. And, and I love technical challenges. And the video game side, I kept sort of putting off. And, you know, like right now I'm doing education, and before that I did a, a series of weird restaurants. And then before that I, I did a toy company, and then I, you know, I did a, a home shopping company, and I, you know, there's so many things to do in life. You just, you know, it's hard to, to figure out what where to light, and uh, I think as soon as I solve this problem in education, I find that I have about a five-year attention span, and that after five years, I get bored with what I'm doing, and, and it, it's my sickness, uh, but, but it's really led to an interesting life, and so I, I don't know. Maybe someday I'll go and come back and do a video game. Like, I really like the idea of doing augmented reality games. You know, where you're walking down the street and, and you, uh, you can be a spy master. And, uh, and you can detect other people through micro, right, micro meshes in an augmented reality. That would be fun to work on. And uh, I've been doing some help with the Oculus project, and I've got a pair of Google Glasses, and I'm a developer, and I don't know. There's just too much stuff to do. And uh, if you do everything, you don't do anything very well. And so, you know, and I could be working on that instead of coming over here and talking to you guys. But this is fun. Uh, you can tell I hate every minute of this. but. Uh, I also think that it's really important to pass the torch a little bit. You guys sitting here, one of you may be the next Steve Jobs. There's no reason why what you start today can't become a world beater. And there's, there's this perception I get sometimes that well, in order to be the next Steve Jobs, you have to go to California. No, you don't. The world is growing, and even though 
certain rules are a little bit, you know, screwed up in certain countries. Uh, you know, the, uh, the opportunity that the internet grows up, corp you know, country boundaries are becoming less and less and less important. You know, Italians have a really good cultural asset. In order to be truly creative, you have to be a rule breaker. The Italians have learned how to break rules better than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so think about it. Uh, you know, a lot of people would just throw up their hands and say, if I had to deal with that government, I wouldn't deal with it. You guys just ignore it, and it, it seems to work. Anyway. <laughs> Here. Just one last okay, one last question. Okay, right hello. Uh, when you created the Pong, did you thought that uh, the video, video game industry would have increased so much as uh, it has? It has ah. Quick, the question was, when I did Pong, did I think it was going to be like this? Yeah. No. But I thought that the video game was going to be very, very important. It was just too good of a game player. Remember, Mankind, from the very first, has been playing games. I mean, we find evidence of, of dug, you know, little pots dug out around campfires in, in the caveman era, where they played this game called Mancala, using the knuckle bones of the animals that they built, that, that they'd eaten. So from that forward, Mankind has always used the technology at the time, whether it be paper or plastic or steel. It was only normal that as soon as computers could play a game, that they would, there would be video games. And so, how big would it, was it going to be? I mean, no question that the smartphone has made it possible to game anywhere. There's no question that the internet has allowed a pervasive and a ubiquitous gaming environment. The consoles are so powerful and wonderful. Um, man is to game. And, uh, you know, they're wonderful building environments. I don't know how many of you have played around with Minecraft, but isn't that a wonderful building tool? It's so simple, it's kind of like video Legos, um, except you have to be safe before dark comes. But that's, that's another story. Anyway, thank you very much. I love Italy. You've been a great audience.